mentioned, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that uh, we kind of got in a in a, a break where we were we've been dealing with premillennial issues for a number of weeks now, and uh, we kind of got into a, a, a break after finishing up the matters of the tribulation, the antichrist, etc. And uh, with only one week, kind of a freestanding week this Sunday night, because we've got singing night next week and meet, eat, meet as part of our winter meeting the following week, I thought it'd be good for us to kind of just take a one, kind of a one-time shot at looking at the book of Revelation and specifically the subject of when the book was written. Now, you can put this in your notebook. Um, um, you can put it right after your tribulation uh, material or you can kind of go to the back of the book. Uh, if you want, but uh, we're going to look at the subject of when was Revelation written. Now there is, remember I said this morning talking about no consensus? There is no consensus on, on, this, on this question. There are at least three different primary ideas on when the book was written. Uh, perhaps the most well-known and the most popular is sometime in A.D. 94 to 96. A.D. 94 to 96. This would likely make Revelation among the last of all the books written. All right? There is a small contingency that believes that the book was written sometime around A.D. 81. And I had never heard this until a couple of years ago. I never even heard this idea until a couple of years ago when uh, Tyler Young had me out. They were studying the book of Revelation in their lectureship out of Mechanicsville. And I was given a couple of different topics, and one of them was this one. And, uh, and I'd never heard the AD 81 idea. And I'll just be honest with you, I don't study a lot of that. You know, I, don't, I, had, I didn't pursue it. And so that's, I mean, it's not that it's not out there, it's just that it's not something that I had read and not something that's commonly uh, believed. Then there is um, what I would say the pre-AD 70. In other words, sometimes shortly before AD 70. And, and these two, these two, the AD and, most, and 96 is really the one that I see a lot, 95, 96. But, uh, but these two are the ones that are most commonly held. This one, I think, more than this one. All right? And so from the outset, let me just say, it doesn't matter to me when you think the book was written. I don't think it's a matter of going to heaven or not. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it's not a matter of going to heaven or not. Uh, and there are, there are some arguments to be made for all of these. Uh, you know, the first time I heard this argument, it was based on a text in, Rome, in Revelation 17. It was based on one specific text in the book that I had never considered. Let me just, th I'm gonna just put this one out to you so you can have it. And uh, in Revelation 17 and verses 9 through... 12. Revelation 17, 9 through 12. And it says, There are also seven kings in verse 10. Five have fallen, the others not yet come. When he comes, he continues a short time. And the beast that was and is not is himself the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. And this argument of uh, uh, Is talking about the Caesars, that there are five that, that were and are not. In other words, there were five Caesars, and then there was another one that was not and yet is. And David Hester, a good friend of mine, faithful gospel preacher, uh, this was the position he took, and this is the first time I'd ever heard it. And I know others now that, that hold this. But in other words, these five kings, the five kings and one and then one and one, uh, had reference, uh, had reference to the Caesars and the lineage of the Caesars through that period of time. Now, I can't explain it because I haven't studied it enough. I mean, I have David's notes somewhere, but, uh, but 
but I, that's that's this. Now this, the late date, this is called the late date, has to do with some external, external, and by that I mean non-inspired, non-inspired writings that attribute this book to the time of, uh, I believe, Domitian. A, a particular uh, one of one of uh, John the ba uh, John the Apostle's uh, counterparts and contemporaries made made a writing that said he said that the book was written, you know, during the writing or during the reign of a, of, a, of a certain I believe it was Domitian, or uh, in uh, A.D. Uh, ninety six. The evidence that I'm going to present for you tonight is the evidence for the, the pre-AD 70. And the evidence that I'm going to present is internal. In other words, I'm going to present evidence from the text that I think lends itself to the early date of the writing. Now, having said that, and I'm sure that probably none of you have ever studied this or given a lot of thought, there is a tremendous difference between believing that the book was written before AD 70 and believing that all prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70. In other words, all the prophecy of the book. Now this doesn't have anything, in this case, doesn't have anything to do with AD 70 doctrine that I talked about this morning. I think Floyd Wallace held the view that the book of Revelation was written and fulfilled, written before AD 70 and fulfilled in AD 70. But he didn't believe that we've missed the resurrection. He didn't believe that we've missed the judgment. He just assigned different ideas to the things that were found later on in the book. Tyler invited me to speak because he thought that I believed the Wallace, the Wallace view. When I told him I didn't, he said, well, man, I'm really interested now to see what you got to say. Because he, because, uh, he thought, he thought I was going to try to present the Wallace view, what I would call the Wallace view, that all the prophecy in the book was fulfilled in AD 70. I don't believe that. There's a difference in saying it was written before and all being fulfilled. Written before, but not fulfilled during or in. Okay? And I'll show you, I'll show you in the text why I believe that it was written before AD 70, but not fulfilled in its entirety at AD 70. In fact, I'm of the mindset that Revelation 20 and 21, 22 still haven't been fulfilled because they talk about the judgment. And so I think there are portions of the book that were fulfilled in AD 70. I believe there are portions of the book that were fulfilled after A.D. 70, and I believe there are portions of the book that have yet to be fulfilled, namely the judgment of all mankind, okay? And so that's my view, that the book was written before A.D. 70. Now, let me explain to you about the, argu about the argument from the internal evidence and why I think it's so important. A number of years ago, a dear friend and colleague of mine, who at that time, I don't know if he still does or not, held a view of marriage and divorce that I thought and believe to this day is not compatible with Matthew 19 verse 9. And his argument was, in Acts 24, 24, now this is just kind of an introduction, but it shows you how to work from the internal as opposed to the external. He held the view that you could divorce and repent and remarry, or if you were in an unscriptural divorce and you became a Christian, you could keep the wife that you had at that time. All right? With, and so it was basically, it was, it was both a non-amenability view and a divorce, repent, and remarry view. So, and I didn't believe that, and I still to this day don't believe that, and I know most of you, probably all of you don't believe that. But uh, his argument was, in Acts 24 and verse 24, the Bible speaks about Felix and his wife, Drusilla. His wife, Drusilla. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 
and verse number two, it says, in order to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. And his argument was that the language of Acts 24, 24 implied that Felix had his own wife, Drusilla. Okay, are you following me so far? That Felix had his own wife, Drusilla. Herein is where this comes into his view. In McGarvey's original commentary on Acts, on page 239, in his comment on Acts 24, 24, <coughs> McGarvey said that Felix had enticed Drusilla to leave her husband and marry him and that they were, and this is his statement, they were living in adultery. They were living in adultery. And so my friend's argument was they were living in adultery, but Paul never told Felix and Drusilla that they had to get out of that marriage. It just says that he reasoned to them of righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come. And so his thinking was they were living in adultery, and yet the inspired writer said, that she was his own wife. Now, the language of 1 Corinthians 7, 2, his own wife, and the language of Acts 24, 24 is not parallel. They're not the same. There is some credence to the idea of his own wife in Acts 24, 24. But if his own wife is accurate in Acts 24, 24, the conclusion is not that God accepted his marriage as, as an adulterous one. The conclusion is McGarvey was wrong. You see? You don't use McGarvey to prove what you want to believe about the Bible. The conclusion is... McGarvey was wrong. In other words, there was probably something about Drusilla's first, first marriage that allowed her to leave her first husband and be married to Felix. But you don't draw your argument based on McGarvey's comment that they were living in adultery and then try to tie that, in, you know, inextricably tie that to the Bible teaching. The proper conclusion that he should have reached was McGarvey was wrong. Not that God accepted their adulterous marriage. That's, his argument was based on the external evidence that McGarvey provided rather than the internal evidence which would have said McGarvey's wrong. Now, I'm not conceding that the language of Acts 24 necessarily implies his own wife. What I'm saying is if it does imply it, it still doesn't mean that they were living in adultery and accepted in the eyes of God. The argument should be McGarvey was wrong, as commentators are prone to be from time to time. So that's what I want to emphasize, that this internal evidence is much, is always, internal evidence is always to be preferred over external evidence. We take the testimony of the Bible over the external testimony of men. So what do I find in the text what do I find in this text internally that would lead me to believe that would lead me to believe that this book was written before AD 7? Well, here's how I here's how it occurred to me because I wasn't I wasn't studying this to, to arrive at a conclusion. But back when I took Carl Sims's 30-day New Testament challenge and I started reading the New Testament every 30 days. Basically, every 29 days, I read the New Testament over every month, month after month after month. And what would happen was, of course, what was the book that I would read last? Revelation. Revelation. But then when I would finish reading Revelation, what book did I go to? Matthew. Matthew. And if you're reading the New Testament every 30 days, you're reading about eight or nine chapters every day. So when I, and I, and you've heard me say this. I've never read the book of Revelation in more than one city. Every time I got to the book of Revelation, I read the whole thing that day. Most of the time, at one time. And if I started it on a day, I finished it on that day. Because I always said, I always wanted to see how it ended. 
Couldn't wait till the next day to see how it ended. And I always read the book of Revelation in one city or in one day, which put me in Matthew 24 three days later. So here I am reading the book of Revelation on a Monday, and then on Thursday I'm reading Matthew 24. And then three days after that I'm reading Mark 13. And three days after that I'm reading Luke 21. So in the next nine days I'm reading three accounts of the destruction of Jerusalem that sound a whole lot like what I just finished reading in the book of Revelation. And that's when my wheels started turning. Like, you know, they're made. And I got this, this, this encouragement from Jimmy Clark. Because Jimmy Clark is a pre AD 70 author, uh, uh, authorship. And his statement is always internal evidence always trumps external. And I believe that, but I've never studied it enough to arrive at what I would believe a firm conclusion. So what do we find internally in the text of the book of Revelation? And by the way, if you want these notes, it's just two pages. And uh, if you want these notes, uh, in fact, the copies are sitting in the copy machine right now. Uh, they are finished. But uh, look at Revelation verse chapter 1, verse 1. What does the internal evidence say? What does the internal evidence say about the events of this book in chapter 1, verse 1, Derek? Must shortly come to pass. Must shortly. What's that mean? It ain't going to be too much longer after you go. That's that. right. Must so, shortly come to pass. That's chapter 1, verse 1. So whatever I'm fixing to read, according to the man that wrote it, is just around the corner. Right. What else do I read in uh, verse number 3? In chapter, chapter 1, verse 3. What word or phrase might I find in that verse? Bless your people that do thee to keep these things. Pay attention to these things. All right. Why? Because it's shortly going to come to pass. There it is. Because the time is what? All right, let's say it hand in King James. Yeah. King James says, the time is at hand or near. Well, what does that mean? What's it mean at hand? About to happen. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven has not yet been established and won't be established for another 2,000 years. Right? No. Oh, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now look at verse 5. I mean verse 7. Behold, he's what? Coming with what? He's coming with clouds. Alright? Somebody turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verses 30 and 31. <clears throat> What's Jesus say in that text? See the Son of Man coming in the clouds. You will see the man, the Son of Man, coming. What? In the clouds. What's Matthew 24, 30, and 31 talking about? Destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of Jerusalem. <clears throat> See, that's why the studies that we've been doing over these last several weeks, especially out of Matthew 24, are pertinent to this discussion. <laughs> He's coming with clouds, and Jesus said, You'll see the Son of Man coming. In the clouds. All right? What about verse number 9? Well, you ought to read verse 34 right there where you was at. Well, I know all that, yeah, these things all come on this generation. Yeah, this generation shall not pass. That's the part. All right, I'll add that for you, Walter. See verse 34. 
Tell all that stuff going to be full right. faith. It's all going to happen right then in that generation. All right? Now, what do we find in verse number nine? There's something going on. And what is it? Tribulation. There's tribulation going on. Now, remember we decided we, we a while back made the notation. We've got to make sure that we're not talking about general tribulation as in persecution or the specific tribulation. But given the time frame of right before AD 70, what would have been going on according to Jesus? Verse 29, Matthew 24, 29, what's going on? Great Yep, tribulation. So we're going to, we're going to cross reference again back to Matthew 24. And verse that's 29, right? Tribulation. So right here in the first nine verses, in the first nine verses, what do we have? The things you're about to read must shortly come to pass. The time is at hand or, or near, coming with clouds, referencing Matthew 24. Tribulation, again, referencing Matthew 24. And so there are, there's four, there are four things in the first nine verses that lead me to believe that all of this is right before the destruction of Jerusalem. Because there's no other event in the history of time that's going to fit the bill of all the things that we're going to read about in the book of Revelation. And if you, if you do read past 87, you've got to assign... you got to find... That's right. you got to find something. A lot of other stuff to all this stuff. That's right. You've got to work hard. And you, you'll never find it. You'll just have to dig up all kinds of stuff. And you'll never... You'll, it'll never fit together unless you spiritualize the whole thing. All right? Now look. I think the guy, I'm pointing at it like it's still up there. The 8096 guys, they tend to spiritualize almost all the things that are, that are in the book. That's perfectly fine because we all still understand the overall message of the book of Revelation, right? And that is this. No matter what happens, Christians win. That's the theme of the book. No matter what happens, faithful Christians win. When? Now let me note also this, just very quickly, just as a quick aside. Back to verse three. What was the admonition? To, what was the admonition? In other words, what were they told to do? This is the why. The time is at hand or near. What was the admonition? What were they told to do? In ver things Keep the things that are written therein. In other words, be diligent to be faithful and don't lose them. <coughs> don't lose track. Because this is about to happen. Alright? Let me just show you one thing right here. Hebrews 10.25 We all know Hebrews 10.25 is the don't forsake the assembly passage, right? Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see what? The day approaching. Question. What's the day that there's what's the day they're supposed to be watching out for? It ain't Sunday. They're looking for signs that are indicating to them that the destruction of Jerusalem is nigh. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't forsake the assembly because it's in the assembly that you'll be reminded to keep watching for the things that are about to come to pass. And if you forsake the assembly, then you'll forget about the things that are about to come to pass. And then you won't be looking for them. And if you're not looking for them, you've had it. You'll get caught up in it. Does that make sense? That's what the Hebrews writers tell them. Don't forsake the assembly. Because if you do, you'll forget to watch for the signs. 
And if you forget to watch for the signs, you'll get caught up. It's the same thing for us today. When Christians forsake the assembly, how much thought do they give to the day of judgment? Probably none. Probably none. They don't give any thought to the day of judgment. And the longer that they forsake the assembly, the more callous they become and hardened they become, and the less they think about eternity, and maybe the less they even pray or think about praying. But those of us that are faithful to attend the services are always reminded of what? We're always being reminded of the judgment, right? We're always talking about obedience and faithfulness and the judgment. And so we come, we assemble, not primarily for the same reason, but the secondary reason to remain faithful is, is there with us. And when we forsake the assembly, we forget about those things that we need to be watching for. I think about it. If I'm, I'm not here, what if the judgment comes while I'm here or before I show back up? That's right. If you well, forsake, what's going to be my answer? See, that's what, what am I going to answer? Right. And so when you're here, it, keep, it keeps your mind right. That's right. All right, so here in the first four, our first nine verses, we have four admonitions that all point to that all point to a uh, uh, an AD seventy, a, a near at hand event. Now let's go to chapter two. Y'all got all this? All right, let's go to chapter two. Let's go to verse ten. You know the verse that we only quote the second half of. Or the, second, or the last third of it? We don't ever talk about the whole thing. What part of that verse do we always talk about? Be faithful for a crown of life. That's right. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. What well, does the verse say that? Well, it does right. Sure it does. It says that. But what's the context of it? Tell me, what, tell, me what's in, tell me what's in that in that text. Well, you're not spared anything that's going to happen to you. All right, and what, but what are those things? What's going to happen? What, is, what does the writer say is going to happen in Revelation 2.10? Some of them are going to be put in prison. Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things what? Now tell us what the whole devil just cast some of you in prison. Suffering. Right. Prison. Tribulation, ten days. Tribulation. Yeah. Suffering, prison, tribulation. <clears throat> Question. Did Jesus talk about these things in connection to destruction of Jerusalem? He sure did. He sure did. He talked about all these things. There'll be tribulation, such as never been seen. That and that uh, the love of many will grow cold and that, that brethren will forsake one another and even family members would cause other family members to be cast into prison. And so there's, in Revelation 2 and verse 10, there's suffering, there's imprisonment, there's tribulation, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a period. It's 10 days. It says, but be faithful. Be faithful. But again, look at the concepts there in chapter 2 and verse 10. Now, and by the way, the, the comparative language in Matthew 24 is verses 9 through 13. Matthew 24, verses 9 through 13. There's the comparative language. What we find in Revelation 2 and verse 10. And by way of reminder, what's Matthew 24 talking about in the first half? Destruction of Jerusalem. All right, now let's go to chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 3. I only need about two more hours to get this done. In Revelation 3, 2 and 3, what are they told to do? Be what? Watchful. And do what? Strengthen the things that remain. Alright? Why? Because it works one perfect before God. Says, I will what? Turn up. 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 Tur
I'll come on you like a thief. If you don't watch and you don't strengthen the things that are remain, I'll come on you like a thief. You see, those that are watching won't get come upon like a thief. Right? Those that were watching for the signs of the abomination of desolation, etc. They were watching. They were not going to be overtaken like a thief. But the one that starts forsaking the assembly, the one that loses his preparation, will be like the five foolish virgins. The bridegroom came when they were off somewhere else instead of where they ought to be because they hadn't made the proper preparations. So he says, do these things because I'll come like a thief. That's on those that are not watching. All right? Also, uh, look at chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. Somebody read those two verses for me. And you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial. I'll keep you from what? The hour of trial. The hour of trial. That's going to do what? Come into the whole world. Keep reading. To try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. I'm coming when? Fast. I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. Hold fast. Again, another admonition to be faithful. Hold fast because I am coming Soon. Literal coming or figurative coming? Huh? The tribulation. Yeah, it's the figurative coming of Matthew 24, 29. We said, you'll see him coming with clouds. That's a figurative coming. So the coming that I'm coming soon is the figurative coming of 87. All right. See here. Well, let me ask you a question, Dallas, on this uh, of revelation about all these churches. Is that not examples of things that's probably going on today? It is. Of, of people that's in the churches. I, be I believe that the seven churches are real churches, and I believe that the problems in the seven churches were real problems. But I believe that these seven churches were chosen because. They represented a broad spectrum of things that all of us would face at some point in time. Whether it be the church at Ephesus. They weren't doing anything wrong. The problem was they weren't doing everything right. You know, they were they were faithful to the word to guard it, but they weren't faithful to do it, so far as leaving their first love. And so there were five churches that got negative uh, statements. And two, that got positive. All right, what about church in Laodicea? Lukewarm. Is that a problem in the church today? Is lukewarmness a problem? Yeah. Sure it is. Is, is worrying about, and don't get me wrong, we've got to worry about the doctrine, all right? We've got to be concerned with being faithful to the doctrine. But are, are, there, are there a lot of churches that are very, very diligent to maintain faithful doctrine, but they're not very evangelistic? Yeah. That'd be the church of Ephesus, right? Are there churches that have a name that they're alive but they're dead? Yep. Like the church of Sardis? See, those churches were real and those problems were real. But they're all problems. They're all problems that all churches can face and have faced at some point in the course of history. All right. Um, I'll tell you what. I'm going to come back to this, all right? It will be probably next week. Unless we want to come early before the singing night. And let me finish. We'll work that out at the appropriate time. But uh, there, are, I, I can finish this in one more session, just showing you, showing you a few things, like in Revelation ten seven, and Revelation seventeen, Revelation twenty. But uh, yeah, Derek. When you read Revelation uh, one one, most people have trouble just with that one verse. When 